All right. Um, so my research is in an um, area of algebraic topology called chromatic homotopy theory. And I would like to start by telling you a little bit about what it is. So here's a few basic definitions. If we have a topological space X, uh, we can consider maps from SN, continuous maps from SN to X, um, where, which we quotient by uh, the, we identify two maps if they're homotopic, and that is the homotopic group of X. So two maps are homotopic if there's a continuous deformation from one to the other. So this picture roughly represents um, a map F and a map G, and this cylinder represents a continuous deformation from map F to F to map G. Homotopy groups are groups. Um, given two maps from Sn to X, we can define the sum, which will also be a map from Sn to X. All right, so uh, one of the basic topological spaces is a sphere of dimension M. So then the natural question to ask is, can we compute maps between uh, two spheres of different dimension? Modular, of course, that equivalence relation again. Um, so despite being very easy to state, this question is incredibly hard to answer. We don't have a general method that works for any N and M. Um, this table represents a little bit of what we do know. Um, each of the groups here was obtained by some very hard case-by-case, -case brute force, often geometric computations. Um, okay, so what do we see here? So these are the spheres, that's one, s two, s three, and so on. These are the homotopic groups, pi one, pi two, pi three. For example, if you wanted to know pi five of s two, that would be z mod two. Um, so one thing that we notice right away about this table is uh, there's a bunch of zeros here in the lower left corner. So what are these groups? Well, for example, pi one of s three and pi two of s three is zero. Um, and that's true in general. If you're trying to map a smaller dimensional sphere into, oh, sorry, into a larger dimensional sphere, there is no non-trivial ways to do that. Okay. So groups in this left lower corner will continue being zero, if, even if I drew the rest of this table. Okay. Well, um, yeah. Uh, regularity ends with that. If you try to read this table in um, rows. There's really no pattern, no structure to this. The groups appear more or less randomly. Um, this, this first non-zero row consists of a zero, and then a z, z, and then z mod two, z mod two, then there's a z mod twelve for some reason. Uh, so there's just no, there's no sense in reading this table in rows or in columns. It's also equally random if you just read it in columns. The correct way to do the, to read this table is to read the diagonals. Okay, so there's a bunch of first diagonals, so zero, zero, but then there's a diagonal that consists of z's, just consistently consists of z's. That's nice. What about the next one? Okay, it starts again very messily, there's a zero, zero, z, but then there's a z mod two that continues being z mod two. Um, then let's go to the, maybe the purple one. Uh, what is the beginning here? Zero, zero, z mod two, z mod 12, z times z mod 12. That's really ugly, that's infinite. And then there is z mod 24, and that continues being z mod 24. So in fact, that is a general phenomenon. Um, groups, homotopy groups of spheres, stabilize along these diagonals. So uh, maps from Si plus n into Sn don't really depend on n. They only depend on i once you, n is large enough. So once you're far enough in that diagonal. All right? OK, so instead of saying, can we compute homotopy groups of spheres, maybe we can say, can we compute stable homotopy groups of spheres? So let's just, you know, we just need to compute one for each diagonal. Maybe we can do that. Maybe that's easier. Ah, yeah, so stable homotopy groups of spheres are these limits. Um, turns out, oh, sorry. Uh, something else I want to say? No. Okay, so um, we change our language a little bit. Since it no longer matters what sphere we're talking about, uh, we stop talking about spheres. Um, so we stop talking about spaces and start talking about spectra. A spectrum is the generalization of a topological space. Um, in particular, the sphere spectrum um, is a topological object um, which has homotopy groups. So this curly S is the sphere spectrum. It has the homotopy groups, uh, which are exactly the stable homotopy groups of spheres. Um, so no matter what you call them, they're incredibly hard to compute. Um, after over 80 years, um, Pi i of the of the sphere spectrum is known completely only up for i 80 or less. All right. Uh, so here, 
in this table I list some of these stable homotopy groups. Some of them are in this big table. So there's a Z, Zima 2, Zima 2, Zima 24, they're here. And then I list a little bit more. Um, I would like to point something out about them. Except for the, the zeros one, they are all finite and abelian. Okay? Great. That's the theorem of Sarah. Um, homotopy groups of the stable homotopy groups of spheres are all finite and abelian um, above dimension zero. So maybe we can just compute them one torsion at a time. Okay? Instead of just computing them straight away, we will take our homotopy groups, break them into p primary bits. So for example, this just represents the two, four, eight, and so on torsion. This represents the um, power of three torsion. And then we do that for every prime. And maybe we just compute it one prime at a time. Maybe that's easier. Um, well, OK, let's see how much easier. Um, so this picture um, shows you a little bit of what we know um, about the five sphere. I chose the five sphere because it just, so five means prime is five. We're only talking about five torsion <laughs> in stable homotopy groups of spheres right now. Um, I chose the five sphere just because we sort of know enough about it for me to be able to show you some patterns, OK? All right, so how do you read this picture? Um, so the, the horizontal axis uh, gives you a number of the homotopy group. So if you would like to know what pi 39 is, you'll find, well, there's a 39 here. And then you just look in this little column right ab above it. So whatever is in there is the group. Um, OK, so this, this dot is sneakily, it's, it's in 38. This dot is not in 39, it's in 38. So pi 39 just consists of two dots. Um, each is order 5. Um, so various lines, vertical, horizontal, uh, slanted lines, represent um, the ring structure, which I will not talk about. The only thing we care about right now is uh, the dots. So each dot is a group of order 5. OK? All right, OK, so what do we see about this? Um, so here's one thing we notice is that suddenly there is some pattern. So this, the groups at the bottom occur with some periodicity. There's a one dot occurring every eight dimensions. There's one new dot, second one, occurring every 40 dimensions, and 39, 79, and so on. There's a third dot in every 200 dimensions. And there's like a fourth one every 1,000. Okay? So there's actually suddenly a pattern. Um, OK, let's see, is there more, or is that the only one? Well. Um, there is, um, so these strips over here repeat every 48 dimensions. And then there's more. There's also some, some uh, clusters of groups that repeat every 248. And there's more. I just, I don't think this picture captures the fourth chromatic level very well. So these, so inside a very messy uh, computational data, um, there are periodic regular patterns. Um, so we call them chromatic levels. So this represents the first chromatic level, this represents the second chromatic level, and then this is the third one. Um, and uh, they give a chromatic filtration on the homotopic groups of spheres. So this is familiar. We take pi star of s, and we choose one p torsion at a time. But then each of these, so this is the two torsion part, um, splits further into chromatic building blocks. Okay. So this, um, let me just a little bit elaborate on the notation. So the first index is just the prime. So this is prime 2. And then the second index is the chromatic level. So chromatic level 1, chromatic level 2, and so on. There's infinitely many chromatic levels, but we have convergence theorems, which, I mean, not I, Hopkins, Ravenel, and um, other people proved um, cr uh, convergence theorems, which allow us to recover um, the, the p primary components out of chromatic bits. All right. OK, so what we need to understand is we need to understand each of these individually and then reassemble them. And we have excellent computational tools for each of these components. It's still very hard, but we, we have more tools now. All right, so what is known right now? Um, chromatic level 1 is related to K theory and is well understood due to theorems of Adams, Mahovald, Miller, and many other people. Chromatic levels 3 and higher are not very well understood. There are some very partial results and very simple computation for simple cases, computations. Uh, but in general, it's not very well understood. Um, a lot of computational work is happening right now in chromatic level 2. Um, and here, the story is a little bit different depending on the prime. So primes 3 and above um, are a little bit easier. 
a little bit more algebraic, less topological. Prime two is harder. Um, homotopy groups of spheres in general. Maybe I guess I have a minute for that, so let me go back to that picture. Homotopy groups of spheres in general have a lot of two torsion. So if you just look at this picture, um, how much three torsion do you see? Well, okay, you see a little bit. I guess there's three torsion here um, and here. There is a little bit of seven torsion even here. Uh, 84, here 84, okay? Um, there is no 11 torsion, at least in this range, but there's a lot of two torsion, it's everywhere. So uh, if you're working in the prime two, you just have a lot of data that you need to compute, organize, explain. So it's just more computations, longer papers, bigger spectral sequences. Um, so the tools are a little bit different, so um, that's why, um, where are we? That's why sort of um, the computations were first made and um, uh, explained at primes three and above. So this the historical um, development went, so first n equals one and then n equals two, but primes higher than three. Actually first higher than five and then three and then two. So now we are here. This is where we're currently making some progress. Um, so which kind of uh, theorems uh, do we have? So here is one recent one. Um, so what we did is uh, we took this sphere, this is a uh, uh, chromatic level two, prime two, sphere. Actually, see there's a bar there, it's not quite a sphere, it's something very closely related to it. And we resolved it in terms of spectra that we really understand very well, we know everything about them. Um, and we, so, and furthermore, so there is a, see there's a epsilon one, epsilon two, and then there are the duals. There's various notions of duality in uh, homotopy theory. So these, these, um, these are the duals with respect to certain duality uh, uh, statements. Um, all right, <coughs> so, and oh yes, and we know everything about these epsilons and we know everything about the maps. Okay, so we can actually say a lot about S22. Um, okay, so what do I wanna say about this? Yeah, so we have used uh, this to explore um, this second chromatic level further. Uh, we computed um, invertible spectra in, in the second chromatic level. Um, we're doing some computations, like this gives us a new spectral sequence, so a new computational tool um, that we're using to actually compute some homotopy groups. That's some current project. And then, um, so the self-duality of it is potentially a very interesting phenomenon. We don't understand yet why it happens, but we think it might be very interesting. It might be also a very general phenomenon that um, everything in chromatic homotopy theory somehow consists of two bits, one very simple one and the other one self-dual to the very simple one. Um, but we're very far from general understanding of why this happened, we just saw it, it just tempted us. Um, so I guess, um, yeah, various applications with result, and um, that's what I want to work on um, while I'm here at IAS. I think that's all. Thank you.